so the Prelinger Archives Online, the Prelinger Archives Online stemmed out of a casual conversation that I had when I first got on the phone with Brewster Kale in um, 1999. And within the first 20 seconds, he said, do you want to put your archives online for free? And I started to stutter. You know, I said, I make, I make money uh, charging for access to my collection. How, how could I give it away? I don't know about this. And, you know, I was new to California. I hadn't... Uh, been inculcated in the sort of, you know, the values of the open source movement, and I knew nothing about free culture. But after thinking about it for a while, I realized that this was an experiment worth um, trying because, you know, I'm a contrarian, and I felt that there were a lot of things wrong about the, the whole archival and stock footage world. And in addition, we had always given out footage for free or just for duplication costs to worthwhile projects like this one or, you know, um, social and cultural artistic community projects that we wanted to see do our little bit to help enable. But it was expensive, you know, because it costs just as much to give something away as it does to charge for it. Um, it's still time and all that. And so in a lot of ways, this it seemed like it offered us a way to do the right thing without experiencing, you know, the, the adverse consequences of doing that. And um, beginning at the, uh, at the very start of 2001, we started to put material on. To the best of our knowledge, we've had over 7 million films downloaded. Now, this may not seem like much, but these are very obscure films. You know, the, the most well-known film that we put up is Duck and Cover. But there's a lot of stuff, you know, that's of interest just to railroad buffs and train spotters or to telephone collectors or to people interested in the history of, uh, you know, Southern California, these small uh, slices of uh, small interest groups. Um, but all in all, we think about 7 million films. Our estimate, and um, this is an educated estimate, is that about 80,000 derivative works uh, have been made from the material that we've put up online. I should say that, uh, you know, a lot of people who own content or who control content or who are gatekeepers to, to content are freaked out about giving things away. And our experience has been, to them, very counterintuitive, to us quite fulfilling. What we found after we put all this material up online, and we put up all our good stuff, the stuff that we knew people wanted, is that our sales went up. One of the things that intrigues me tremendously about the proliferation of material that's out there in the world for people to grab is the potential creation of millions of new authors. Um, and, you know, the consequent breakdown of that sort of, you know, long-lasting barrier between consumers and producers. It's bandied about all over the place, you know, participatory media, but my personal experience is that um, when you begin to get millions of new authors, really, really interesting things can happen. And from an archivist's point of view, or a librarian's point of view, when you put primary materials in the hands of ordinary citizens, really, really interesting things can happen. History becomes, you know, uh, history is no longer the province of academics and intellectuals. Uh, culture become, definitions of culture begin to shift and change in very interesting ways. And as we know, questions of what's high culture and what's low culture often get inverted and, or, or, uh, or scrambled in, in ways I think are tremendously productive. Um, Larry Lessig talks about the model of scarcity being supplanted by the model of plenty, which is a, a way of thinking that I like a lot. And when the model of plenty begins to, to rule, as I think it is now, people have a tremendous amount of information at their disposal. Uh, some of it is fact, some of it is not necessarily fact, but in terms of history, which is, is, is what I work with, um, when you put uh, history in the hands of ordinary people, you enable them to do what I call historical intervention. Our archives is a historical intervention. This library is a historical intervention. It means re-injecting um, the past, re-injecting the, uh, the content, the discourse, the ideas, the text, the images of the past into the present and, and giving us the opportunity to look at the present differently. In other words, recon recontextualizing the present through infusion of historical material. Tremendously exciting. It means it uh, gives us the opportunity to, to snap ourselves out of this uh, eternalized present where we believe that everything is new, everything is fresh. We are the first generation to experience what's happening now. 
Um, I actually find it provocative and fascinating. When I, I started showing people old educational and industrial films back in the 80s, I realized that we all had tremendously stereotypical ideas about the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s in American life. And um, when I started showing people these films, quickly in conversation we could move beyond these sort of simplified formulations like it was a simpler time, people were kinder, it was safer, it was better for kids, you know, there was no dissent in the 50s. All these simplified ideas kind of fell away and we could, could see um, the past and the present and its complexity. In general, I'm all for abundance because I think it enables uh, sort of new forms of social expression and critique, but I don't think that that's inherently true. Um, you know, people could always go to libraries and use what they found in libraries in different ways. It's, it, it's not so much the pre-existence of a lot of information that changes it. I think it's what people, the use that people make of it. I think what, to me, the abundance of authors uh, and the abundance of voices is, is much more central. You know, all over the, the place there's these amazing stories about people making new work without permission and using the net as this amazing distribution system. I made this, you know, fairly rarefied experimental feature film, um, put it online, got into the Rotterdam Film Festival, got reviewed in the New York Times. I'm fundable now to make more work in ways that I wasn't before. Um, and uh, I'm not even the most, the, you know, I'm one of a million examples. Uh, what interests me is the fact that uh, the world is bifurcated um, between people who believe that they can do that, know they can and often do it, that see it as an opportunity, and then um, the other group who's often older and more established who's completely threatened by that. So the world of documentary film is very interesting. Documentary filmmakers have always been interested in getting their work presented behind the red velvet curtain, PBS primetime. HBO, uh, you know, theatrical, um, uh, Channel 4 UK. Um, there's always been this interest in, in the best possible presentation for your film. And, you know, that system can only absorb a small number of works at any one time. And a lot of people from that group, you know, who have great, great talents and great abilities to do wonderful work don't want to make online work. For them, the, you know, the web is for uh, lower life forms or for people that are just getting established. And what I'd be very concerned about is trying to get those people won over to this much more open system. It means they have to compete. It means they lose privilege. They lose that sort of handicap that they already have. Um, but that, to me, is a big problem, that there are people who basically don't want to pick up these these great tools that are there. We need to also move away from, you know, query driven, from a query driven internet where you have a search engine and you, you fill the box with something that you think you want with your, you put your intention in the box and then something comes back to you. We need to be able to surprise people. We need to, uh, this was great about the early net, you know, and Netscape or the what's new and the what's cool buttons. Um, you'd be surprised. So on Google you have the I'm feeling lucky button, but you don't have the surprise me button. Serendipity, discovery, surprise, very, very powerful function psychologically. Again, endangered species. Um, this library, which my partner Megan and I built, is all about serendipity. It has an idiosyncratic taxonomy that Megan designed. The idea is that you go to an area of interest and then you become surprised. We don't have a catalog. We're not query based. We're not the typical library where the first thing you see when you walk in the atrium is a computer asking you to formulate a query and then it tells you where to go find a book. We don't believe in that. We believe in, in, in letting people look at the books and, and, and be surprised. So we, we were, a, a writer recently said about us that this is, we want people to find what they're not looking for. This is getting to be hard to do online because things are all query based, you know. You can do wonderful things with databases, especially when they're very, very large mass databases. But just like science is science, medicine, education, and the criminal justice system are trying to breed out the unusual and shift us in the direction of a monoculture, in a lot of ways this is what a query based um, 
query-based interfaces do this in terms of knowledge. Uh, how are we going to be surprised? How are we going to be exposed to new things? Um, I think we really need to keep that alive.